Giunge il momento di un ospite importante che ha scritto e ha raccontato un po' quello che è il percorso della società dell'informazione e dell'era che stiamo vivendo e ci racconterà anche cosa sta per accadere e ho il piacere di lasciare il palco al professor Manuel Castells. Come stai? Tutto bene. Cosa succede? So, great. <laughs> This is a particular period, no? Because we have a digital transition, but this is also a, a new era, artificial intelligence era. Mm -hmm. But I have a question about the education system in this period. What do you think about the importance of education for young generation in this period? It's more fundamental than ever uh, because we have to adapt uh, the digital technologies to the current education without destroying what the education system is about. Um, and um, it's not the machines that educate, the teachers educate. Okay. And I will present in my lecture um, all recent research that demonstrate that computers damage education. Okay. Okay? Um, artificial intelligence still different and we'll see. But the most important thing in education is the quality of the teacher and the quality of the communication systems that students have. And the recent research shows that textbooks, okay. notebooks, and pencils are much better than computers. And, and you know the demonstration of this last week, only last week, Sweden, that was the first country to move entirely to digitization of the school, has changed. Sweden is eliminating computers as a way of education. There are computers in the school and there is internet, but this is not the main. Uh, last week, this is the latest news. And what Sweden is now, restoring textbooks, okay. pencils, and notebooks as the main tool for education. What about that? Fantastic. And a question about politics. Mm -hmm. uh, also for artificial intelligence, there are some governments that are working to use artificial intelligence for all the government aspects. What do you think about? Well, governments will have to regulate artificial intelligence, but, being, but doing it in an intelligent way. Because the problem is not artificial intelligence, it's the lack of human intelligence. Okay. And therefore, the regulations have to be able to uh, take advantage of the extraordinary digital progress, while at the same time is making sure that the tools are used for the benefit of education, of society, of uh, interconnectivity, uh, companies' productivity. So it has to be regulated, but we still don't know exactly how. Okay. Because uh, ChatGPT is very, very recent. Very recent. And therefore, um, we have to see. Yes. Um, and the latest research, which I will explain in my talk, Uh, shows that we are still in the midst of finding the way to make artificial intelligence a tool and not a servitude. Professor Castells, è tutto vostro. Buongiorno a tutti. Um, Uh, first of all, I want to thank very sincerely the organizers of this important event, a very important event, um, for giving me the opportunity to meet you 
and share with you the latest research and thoughts that I develop on the digital society. Um, let me first start with the basics. Uh, you have, you should have uh, been distributed a code to access a PowerPoint uh, through your cell phones, a PowerPoint that I prepare for this talk. Because I think my contribution here is to provide you the ideas and the summary, the synthesis of what we know, rather than spending a few precious minutes in um, uh, showing you uh, data and tables and PowerPoints that you can find easily once I give you the reference. So you have the PowerPoint. I will not talk about the PowerPoint. This is the background for what I have to say. And I will try to concentrate on the substance, on what you really would, would, would be interested about. Uh, first of all, uh, information in all forms is the blood of life. The blood of life. Life is made of energy and information. Um, and what characterizes our societies is the general digitization of information and communication. Today, in the planet, 95% 95, 99.5, 99.5% of information is digitized, digitized, and accessible over networks. This is completely ch changes everything, but how it checks everything, how it changes, this is what I will try to explain. We live in the moment of the digitization of everything meaning digital networks and digital processing for all aspects of life. For the last 30 years, there has been a gradual expansion of digital networks. Yes, there is an uneven development in terms of countries and social groups and social classes, but since our world is globally networked, everybody and everything is affected by these digital networks, even when they are not connected, because networks, as we know, both include and exclude. To be disconnected of these networks is as important as to be connected. This is what I called and uh, conceptualized uh, many years ago a new form of society, the network society, that um, replaces the industrial society of the last 200 years. Um, Certainly, this network society did not come from technology, came from a number of social and economic features. But uh, without digitization, this network would not work. Therefore, the network society is a, is a new social structure whose core activities are organized around digital networks and high-speed connectivity. For instance, globalization is a Global network of global networks. This is what is globalization. The business has been transformed by the emergence of what um, we call the network enterprise. That is, networks of companies and companies that are internally net networked and decentralized. The network enterprise is the new organization business model. Multimedia business work networks are the form of all media today. They are connected and they are multimedia and uh, organized in different business groups. Personal communication is based on interpersonal social networks, as everybody knows, which develop a new kind of uh, sociability, a new kind of cultural relationship, which is what we call network individualism. It's not individualist. People are connected but they are connected as individuals. Also, from this networking logic emerge the social movements of our time, which are network social movements based on the internet, which are the movements that are uh, acting and changing the world. 
There is a network state that replaces the nation state made of different networks of different states. There is also globally network metropolises around the world and within each particular metropolis. War is being fought by um, cyber war and drone wars. Again, every domain of what used to be human activity is now being transformed. I did not predict all that because I'm a social scientist, if you have not realized yet, and not a futurologist. But the embryos of the transformation underway were there 30 years ago. Simply, they had deployed fully, full deployment of this logic in the 21st century. Now, the digitization of society is different than the network society. Network society is a society. Digitization is a technology that transforms and permeates all kinds of activities. And these are the transformations that I want to refer to in this talk. The key new technologies for the digitization of society are fundamentally two. New connectivity, 5G, but it's already 6G, as I have been able to observe in Shenzhen in the laboratories of Huawei. Um, what is this new connectivity? It's a qual qualitative and quantitative transformation of three characteristics of connectivity. Speed of the connections, volume of the amount of data that you can transmit, and latency. That is the time of feedback when, from when we send a message to when we receive. The three together have altered completely um, the uh, connection because now we can really live in real time in every activity. And from the local to the local, from the local to the global, from the global to the global. The other is artificial intelligence, which finally is coming of age. Uh, we have been talking about artificial intelligence, and Hollywood has been talking about artificial intelligence for a long time. Now it's really happening. Uh, there are, these are models of data processing, calculation, reasoning, decision making, and lately what we call generative pre-trained transformer models capable of inducing what is called emerging properties within uh, the model that were not predicted that depend on the ability of the model to regenerate and generate itself. Models do that by using large language models supported by gigantic databases that are uh, in the cloud. ChatGPT is the most well-known example uh, developed by uh, OI, the company, uh, but it's also Google's BART, is Bing from Microsoft, is Ernie Bot from Baidu, that people don't talk about here, but in China is very important, and there are a number of others. The most interesting one is Claude from Anthropic, and I will, it's my favorite, and I will explain you in a moment why. Now, the, um, all this means that there is the race is on in terms of competition between multiple companies and actors to see how to develop more powerful, more appealing models of based on artificial intelligence. Um, there is a major change here. Artificial intelligence was um, the domain of uh, mainly re top research universities. MIT mainly, Berkeley where I uh, taught for 24 years. Um, but now, in terms of the proportion of uh, researchers on artificial intelligence, two thirds are in private companies, which transforms everything in terms of the both control and the flexibility of the intelligence. Now, um, because the major challenge that this offers to society, uh, there is a global alarm in society institutions and in the industry itself, as you know, even the companies that are developing artificial intelligence are warning about its potential effects. 
I will refer to this later because uh, to really understand it, uh, we have to place the transformation of artificial intelligence in the transformation of all the other digital technologies that converge toward a new form of, of life and social organization. Only then we can understand the possibilities and difficulties of the regulation of artificial intelligence. So what is the actual impact of digitization on different domains of life and society? Um, first, communication is now network communication. Um, the main way for people to communicate is not television anymore, is not radio anymore, is social networks. That ha they have 5.4 billion users, regular users. 5.4 billion and keeps going. To these social networks, we should add machine to machine networks. Uh, this is what is called the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is the same connections, but not among people, but among machines. Machine to machine networks are three times more, uh, connect three times more units than social networks. All these data are stored in the cloud. The cloud is the network of mega servers that are distributed around the world and they're accessible by high speed digital communication networks. Now, here is an important issue. Most of these servers are located in the wealthiest and most developed countries. So digital sovereignty is very limited for most people. The data of everybody, and including Europe in many cases, are located somewhere else. Uh, in the more developed countries, particularly the United States, but also Europe, but the United States, um, some Asian countries. In other words, this, all this uh, creates new problems for sovereignty. Now, since the model of functioning of all this is the importance of data retrieval. Data are critical for everything. And because major companies and governments spend their time obtaining data and retrieving data, this is the end of privacy, no more privacy. We'll see regulations, but there's no more privacy. We have formed, and we, all of us, every day, we build a digital repository, which is us, us. Uh, communicating our data and our life and our everything to this digital uh, hypertext. Everything is there, all what we are, all our activities and our identities are there and interconnected. Credit cards, if you really want to have privacy, forget about credit cards. Uh, do as uh, the uh, drug traffickers do, pay cash. Uh, anything that you pay with a credit card becomes recorded and is known. Credit cards, bank records, tax records, transactions of, a, of every kind, social security records, company records, government records, electoral records, medical files, all is linked with one number. Can be an ID number, a, a driver license number like the United States, uh, or a, a social security or government ID. So, and in addition, all our personal interaction, very personal, in the social networks is also recorded in the hypertext. All this is accessible. So, our data, the data of our lives, are used by companies and by governments, mainly. Companies, they use it for their business model. Their business model of most of the major uh, internet companies is based on actually using data for all kinds of advertising. Um, Facebook, 98% of the revenue is advertising on the basis of our data. Google, 81%. TikTok, 97%. Also, um, they relate to insurance companies or, or banks to, 
to decide how to deal with us, credit, not credit, uh, and, and different loans. Governments used to surveil. We are in the largest surveillance system in history because since everything is in the digital text, it's so easy to surveil. But to surveil requires very large uh, government agencies. The most important of all, of course, is the NSA, National Security Agency of the United States. But it's also very important, the British GCHQ. Um, every country has a major agency. Mossad from Israel is very active. And many of these agencies are interrelated forming something that I have uh, labeled a global surveillance bureaucracy. Yes, there are forms of legal control in democratic countries. Uh, really? For instance, if I take the United States, uh, they require for surveillance activities specific to individuals something called uh, the authorization of the FISA court, F-I-S-A. It's a judicial court that has to give their authorization. Well, the only problem is 99% of the requests are approved by the FISA court. So it's a, a rubber stamp um, procedure. Of course, China and Russia have the equivalent of surveillance bureaucracies with even less control. Then when the, encry the encryption of messages is too difficult to crack, it, everything can be cracked, but when it takes too much work, then there are new technologies emerging. The most popular of which is from an Israeli company, is Pegasus. Uh, the, the company is not Pegasus, the program is Pegasus, that intrudes directly into smartphone communications. Uh, this has been used, proven, for instance, by the Spanish government to spy Catalan independentists, but also by the Moroccan government to spy the Spanish government. Everybody does it. So I try to picture this as the world in which there is Big Brother, as we always fear. Now, Big Brother is serious because it's global surveillance agency, but there are also what I call little sisters, which is all the companies that uh, retrieve uh, our data to process them commercially. And this is key, it's the business model. In Silicon Valley, we say, if you are not paying for something, you are paying with your data. There's not such a thing as a free uh, service. Therefore, as the legendary business leader, Scott McNeely, said already in 1999, privacy in the internet era, get over it. Get over it. There's no more privacy. Another major transformation is the transformation of the spatial pattern of activities um, and population distribution through teleworking and teleservices. You know, for a long time, uh, it was predicted that advanced telecommunications would allow for spatial dispersion of population and activities. In fact, we observe the contrary. In these last 30 years has been the largest wave of urbanization in history. The more and more the population is concentrated. Uh, we are just 60% urban, and of this, the majority concentrates in large metropolitan areas. What we have seen is the formation of mega metropolitan regions uh, that absorb more and more population, wealth, and power. However, uh, these mega concentrations are globally connected, and therefore, this is the real architecture of our world. But more advanced digital operating systems and more powerful connectivity allow now for the spread of teleworking. That was very limited. Particularly information processing, understanding by teleworking at least, at least three days a week, and also working from different locations, office, work, transportation, what we call the office on the go. During the COVID pandemics, as we all know, 
we had to telework out of necessity. And most people were saying, well, after the pandemic ends, we will go back to normal. And no, no, no. Because companies and people had found it very convenient, cheaper, more easy. There is still a contradictory movement, but overall, in the PowerPoint you have the, the information. Overall, uh, if, we, if I take the two countries who have good information, the US and the UK, um, 12 years ago, less than 10% of the workforce uh, were teleworking. Now is over one third of the labor force and keeps growing. I must say, by the way, that in Italy is one of the lowest lowest countries in terms of uh, teleworking and it's not progressing very fast. It's less than 10%, between 8 and 9% at this point, and it's not going as fast as other countries. You will find, find out why. Uh, this is not that workers will live in the countryside, in the middle of the mountains, but they live in cheaper cities, easier to leave cities, or in the outer periphery of metropolitan areas on the conditions that services such as education and health are also decentralized. Ultimately, telecommerce, telefood delivery, tele-everything, streaming, entertainment, amplifying this trend. We have seen the emergence of the Amazon model, the Uber model, the Netflix model. All these are pushing toward metropolitan decentralization and reversing concentration in some areas that form the nodes of the global intermetropolitan network. And I come now to what my colleague mentioned before, uh, the importance of learning and education. Uh, you know, education is the most important human activity. Why? Because on the one hand, is the basis of opportunities. Without education, there are no opportunities. And on the other hand, it's also the source of knowledge and information, and therefore of productivity, and therefore of economic growth. So social progress and economic growth, ultimately culture development as well, depend on education. And so, since education is basically about information processing and communication in the school system or in other networks of learning, uh, there is this idea that <clears throat> digital technologies are transforming education, and they are, but not exactly as it was expected. Um, to understand the impact of digital technology on education, we, ha has, we first have to, rem to remember what, which are the key factors in education. Good education is much more than academic learning, it's also formation of personality, holistic human development. And there are three factors that are determine the quality of education. The first is the social background, unfortunately. The more the parents are educated, the more the children are educated. Usually more education correlates with um, income, but not necessarily. The key thing is education. The education of the parents develops the education of the children on two conditions. On the one hand, the quality of the teachers and the attention of the teachers in the school system. The teacher is the central uh, element in the education system. Second, the attention provided by parents at home to their children. This was the case and is still the case, and this is not changing. Now, what happens with digitization of the uh, process of education and the school system? Well, inequality of access to digital equipment and connectivity, of course, increases inequality in education, uh, that's as in everything. But um, given that, given that there is inequality, but what is what we know in terms of research, not opinion, research about what happens uh, with education. Certainly, the old idea of 
one laptop per child was a complete failure because the laptop without internet is a calculator plus a typewriter. So, of course, uh, then they were connected to the internet. Good. Once the schools were connected to the internet, the problem was the diversity of materials and information accessible to the children created huge confusion among the students at all levels of education, and particularly the lower level and secondary level. Therefore, it would require, effective use of internet would require guidance from the teachers who had to be aware and acquainted with the new forms of pedagogy, which was not the case because they were not provided the training, the knowledge, or the salary. Moreover, um, textbooks, textbooks, uh, together with notebooks and pencils, the traditional forms, had been shown as a more reliable source of information and more effective than the internet in academic outcome. This is not my opinion. This is what the research is finding. Why? Because given the diversity and the noise in the internet information, at least with a textbook, even if it can be challenged in some ways, a textbook is a point of reference to which both teachers and, and pupils can refer. And sorry to say that uh, what we know is that this has been a complete change. Uh, recently, it's reversing. I was uh, commenting a minute ago, Sweden was the first country to digitize um, education system. Last week, they decided to reverse. They decided that computers were less important than textbooks, and they started to reintroduce textbooks in the schools. What the research shows, before going into artificial intelligence, the research on computers and schools, there's a huge amount of research. I cite the conclusion, the one conclusion, um, for the latest research, 2022, from um, OECD and the educational associations. And I cite the, the one-line conclusion. The results of the research suggest that there is a negative association of computer use at the school, a negative association of computer use at the school and test scores. The more computers, the lower the test. Moreover, a student academic performance suffers if students use information technology at home for a school task and the top performers of the students are the most negatively, negatively affected, particularly with respect to mathematics. There is a huge survey that was done in 2020 in, in Europe, and the results were that um, for a number of countries, there was no association between digital technology computers and student scores. But for other countries, there was a large negative coefficient. And these countries are Finland, Greece. Remember what I'm saying. Uh, negative association. The more computers, the less score. Finland, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Spain, and above all, Germany the country in which computers at the school uh, actually worsen the performance. The implication is that the use of information technology at home for a school-related task actually results in average student achieving lower scores, and for the high achievers, even more so. Well. Some people were shocked when all these studies started to, to happen. But this is, this is the, real, the reality of what is going on. Digitization is extraordinary, but if under certain conditions um, is not accompanied by a reform of the education system, uh, it becomes a negative. Now, 
What about artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, we still don't have enough research to say conclusively what's happening. But the first indication is that artificial intelligence is helping more education. It's helping more because uh, it provides information for the teachers, provides a beginning of work for the students. But at this point, uh, we, it's difficult to experiment on artificial intelligence and education because there is such an alarm, such a horror in the educational system that chat GPT is going to allow students to copy in the exam, horror, copy, uh, to do the work for the students. This is the conservative attitude of the school system for whom the notion that the students should be given some tools and then uh, not to concentrate on memorizing challenges authority, challenges the traditional education system when it's not the case. Uh, artificial intelligence can be used in many ways in useful forms, both for teachers and for students, under certain controls. But what is really happening? If I take the United States where ChatGPT has developed very fast, in one month reached 100 million users, if I take that, uh, the large majority of the school districts in the United States have prohibited the use of ChatGPT. Prohibited. In the universities, um, the notion is under certain conditions you can allow, but always citing, saying that you are using ChatGPT and explaining why. So there is extremely conservative attitude to um, reject before even understanding and using ChatGPT. You know what? It will happen anyway because the students are smart, and if they, they cannot do it, they still will do it, but without control. I have not finished. I have not finished. You can finish. I have not, I have not finished, because we said we talked 30 minutes, and it's uh, 35. But it's OK. I finish. Thank you. Professor Manuel Castells, a cui there is an award for the professor. Thank you. Very nice. Huh? For all the work. Thank you.